Good morning, good day, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Hartmut Meyer, and I work for the ABS initiative of GRZ, and uh, I love to welcome you to our webinar on understanding DSI, which the ABS initiative is um, doing in cooperation with the Secretariat of the Convention of Biological Diversity, one of a series of webinars on DSI. Um, let me just um, start with a short housekeeping rules before we actually go to the opening of the webinars. Um, um, as usual, so if you participated in previous webinars, you, you would know this. Um, the webinar will be recorded and published, and that means that the presentations will be recorded and published um, of this webinar. And um, you, in this webinar, because we expect a lot of participants, we have almost 600 people registered, there will be no possibility of direct interaction of the participant. That's, of course, um, we need to apologize for that. But we um, have a possibility for you to post questions. And um, all the questions, uh, of course, cannot be answered during the webinar. But we will take all questions we get from you to produce um, a frequently answered question um, um, document and page afterwards. Um, the, the session will be translated. So we have um, um, the choice between English and French. So if you look at the bottom of your Zoom page, you can see this interpretation um, bottom. And there you have options between um, English or French language, or you just um, don't choose any language, then you will hear the original languages uh, spoken by the participants. As we said, we have a lot of registrations. Um, that means we have closed the chat in this webinar. If you have any questions, please use the question and answer box also at the bottom of your screen. You can see this symbol, this Q&A symbol. And you can um, write your questions or comments. Um, and I think um, there's also something we like to announce. So if you, before you pose questions, write questions, please um, have a look and think about it, whether there is another question already in this chat, which is similar to your question or, or very close. And then in that case, you better like the question which comes close to yours before, like you see with this little hand here. So, and the more likes a question receives, the higher it will climb in, in the list of these questions. So it's, uh, then it has a high probability to be directly answered in our session. Um, just to give you a very short overview about the agenda, um, we organize this um, webinar in two blocks. The first is, an expert input to introduce you into DSI. So what does it mean? Um, how is it produced and stored and used? So a technical introduction into the complex topic of DSI followed by a QA session. Then we have a break. And then there's a second block of information about how DSI is used in, uh, is, um, is mentioned and um, dealt with in international fora. We give an overview about this and also there you will have an expert input to see um, what the UN fora are doing with DSI. And also there we have a Q&A session. This uh, is essentially the short introduction, the housekeeping. And with that, I like to give the word to the Secretariat of the Convention on Biological Diversity. And there it is Elisabeth Mrema, the Executive Secretary of the CBD, who will give a short opening for this um, yeah, series of webinars 
And unfortunately, she cannot do this in person. So we have a video recorded, which will be shown to you now. Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the first of this webinar series on digital sequencing information on genetic resources, or popularly known as DSI. The goal of these informal webinars is to foster a common understanding and insight of the concept of digital sequencing information, what it means, how it is generated and used, and how it is being addressed under the Convention on Biological Diversity. The second webinar in the series to be held on 9th December 2020 will look at the outcome of the ad hoc technical expert committee report to get an understanding of the information that came out of the peer review process. A third webinar to be organized early in 2021 will share some of the policy proposals emerging from different informal discussions and research projects. Many of you may recall that the 14th meeting of the Conference of the Parties, parties agreed on the importance of digital sequencing information for three objectives of the convention, and that access and use of digital sequencing information contributes to scientific research as well as other non-commercial and commercial activities. It was also agreed that further capacity to access, use, generate, and analyze digital sequencing information is needed in many countries. However, because there is divergence of views among parties regarding benefit sharing from the use of digital sequencing information, parties committed to working towards resolving this divergence through science and policy-based process established for this biennium. Therefore, this webinar series provides an opportunity to share some of the results of the science and policy-based processes with the wider public and explore options emerging from other informal processes. As many of you know, access and benefit sharing is a complex issue. It involves a multitude of stakeholders with different interests, realities, and views. When dealing with complex issues and divergent views, creating a safe space to exchange and build common understanding is essential to finding the compromises and solutions needed to advance our greater common goals. Looking ahead, we need to reflect and ask ourselves with the relevance of digital sequencing events is not only for the objectives of the convention, but also to the success of the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. Time is running out. We must remind ourselves what is at stake. We are quickly running out of the opportunities to change the path we are on. We all agree that biodiversity is being lost at unprecedented rates, putting our very existence and the existence of our future generation in peril. The stakes are high. It is important that we think outside the box and find new and innovative ways to change the tide and put us on the path to living in harmony with nature and our fellow human beings. By sustainably using and biodiversity and sharing the benefits arising out of utilization fairly and justly, we will ensure the conservation of biodiversity. I take this opportunity to thank the ABS Capacity Development Initiative for partnering with us to bring you the first of the webinars in the series, wishing you an informative webinar and a good and a sustainable path forward. Thank you. Esteemed uh, participants, good day to all of you, wherever you are on the globe. I too 
would like to take the opportunity to welcome you on behalf of the Secretariat of the Convention on Biological Diversity. I take this opportunity to thank the ABS Capacity Development Initiative and its donors, the German Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development, the European Commission, the Swiss State Secretariat for Economic Affairs and the Government of Norway for partnering with us to bring you the first of the webinars in the series. It intends, as was said before, to bring us all to a common understanding of the technicalities and applications of this very complex matter. I wish a meaningful and productive webinar to all of you and look forward to having you join us next week as well. With that, once more, you are all welcome and may, may we have very good deliberations. Andreas, I give over to you. Thank you very much, Sam, for this short introduction <clears throat> and your kind words. Um, I'm Andreas Dreyf, I'm the manager of the ABS Capacity Development Initiative, and uh, which is a multi-donor initiative, as mentioned already by Sam. Thank you very much for that. And uh, we were founded or we, yeah, we were launched and founded in 2006 and we are supporting the implementation of the third objective of the convention as well as the Nagoya Protocol since then. And we are working in uh, primarily in Africa, but also in the Caribbean and the Pacific regions and <clears throat> uh, uh, and uh, the core processes are, of course, uh, supporting the national implementation, but um, also to support and facilitate, as we did in the early stages, international negotiation processes. In the early days, we were supporting the African group in getting to hold with uh, the technical issues under ABS, uh, under access and benefit sharing, and uh, in, in the negotiation process of the Nagoya Protocol. <clears throat> Uh, today we are engaging and we have been uh, supported especially by the government of Norway and uh, under the, its partnership on biodiversity uh, with the government of South Africa to support a technical uh, understanding and dialogue of the, of the DSI negotiation process within the African group but or even on a global scale. Um, to that end, <clears throat> We organized already a, a first global dialogue, DSI dialogue last year in Pretoria to promote this basic understanding and to generate this understanding. And um, yes, we are indeed very much pleased and honored by the, uh, that the uh, CBD secretariat uh, requested us to, to host this first webinar of its series as mentioned by the executive secretary in, in her statement. Um, this dialogue is, or this series of webinars is to foster the science policy dialogue on DSI as actually has been agreed by the parties at the last conference of the parties. And this today's webinar, of course, is as already mentioned by Hartmut, uh, designed to provide uh, a technical intro and a technical overview on, onto the subject so what it is about and uh, how it's being dealt with in the different subjects. But <clears throat> before going further, um, I think it, it's worth to have a look at uh, who actually is participating in this webinar. We, as uh, mentioned briefly, we have almost 600 registration uh, for this webinar. And I think it's worth to have a look at the regional and sector representation of the different stakeholder groups, the academia, the scientists, and, and so on, <clears throat> uh, indigenous peoples and collections, who all the stakeholders who play a key role in, 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 uh, in handling DSI. So please, uh, yeah, tick on your screen. Uh, you see the, 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 the two questions on the regional, uh, where, you, where you are based, where you are working, and uh, and which sector you are representing. So if you please uh, enter this question or answer these questions, then we can get an overview on where you are from and, and, and who is participating in this webinar.
Please colleague, give me a sign when we have some results to screen so that I you can have a look and see what is the outcome of that short poll on <clears throat> uh, on the representation in this uh, session today. I think important while you are doing this uh, poll and uh, and it's being processed in the background. Ah, there we have already the information. Um, yes, um, though of course, yeah, quite a lot are government organizations, very few indigenous peoples, quite a lot of academia, some collections, and quite I think quite well spread over the different regions, the UN regions, which are participating in the international CBD processes. Um, of course, some imbalance towards Europe and the other regions, <clears throat> but I think also quite good representation from the others. Thank you very much for that. <clears throat> um, today's webinar indeed is uh, split into or built uh, through with two sessions the first one will provide an introduction as mentioned by hartmut and the second one will uh, provide an overview how dsi is being dealt with in international fora these sessions will be moderated by two of our colleagues from olivier rocundo and eva fenster and <clears throat> Each session will be, as also mentioned already, followed by a question and answer session. As indeed, we will not be able to answer on, answer all the questions which might be raised. Um, we will. This will serve to uh, for us to develop a, a, a frequently asked questions document uh, or website. Um, in addition to the other knowledge products which have been developed already by the ABS initiative on DSI, such as the DSI primer, <clears throat> which was published before the first global dialogue uh, in Pretoria last year. And uh, uh, second, I think a second key product, um, which will have a, its world premiere today, uh, right now, a short video, which um, is actually the first part of a video called DSI Simply Explained, which we will screen uh, immediately. And uh, of course, we would appreciate also feedback on this very first version, this um, in the question and answer box. <clears throat> and after the video, then Olivier Rocundo will take over to introduce the first session on uh, how DSI is being uh, generated, used, and um, uh, uh, and used, yes, basically that. With that, uh, Yannick, you can start the video, I think. <clears throat> Thank you very much, and a good webinar. There are technologies that are game changers. Some are widely visible, such as smartphones or the internet. Then there is ESI digital sequence information, the result of sequencing genomes or proteins. DSI has revolutionized biological science in a way that was unthinkable 20 years ago and is still largely unknown to the public. But the impact couldn't be bigger. Now, to understand DSI, we have to dive into the principle of any life on Earth. Every animal, every plant, and every other living thing exists because every cell carries a construction plan within, the DNA. The DNA is an extremely long string of four different chemicals, commonly referred to as A, G, C, and T. These chemicals are arranged into a genetic code that determines how an organism looks, grows, and lives. To give a little more perspective on how far we've come, the sequencing of the first human genome started in 1984. It took almost 20 years and cost over 2 billion US dollars. Now, it takes a day and costs less than a smartphone. The use of DSI offers a wide range of new possibilities, such as finding better cures for diseases, identifying microorganisms that harm plants, adapting crops for climate change, 
and protecting endangered species. For any of this to happen, the biological resources must have their genes sequenced. And then the sequence information must be stored and made available to researchers. There are three main databases where DSI is stored. One in Japan, one in Europe, and one in the United States. Unlike the unknown number of private data collections, they follow an open access policy and exchange their data daily. Scientists can now work on projects without having to acquire the biological resource from its country of origin. This saves time and money. But some countries are concerned that they might lose out on benefits. This has caused international disagreement about the current DSI system, although the enormous progress made through DSI is undisputed. Yes, hello, good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Olivia Rocundo. Uh, thank you, Andreas, for uh, providing a little bit of a background as to what will be actually discussing today. And uh, I have been asked to moderate the first session uh, of this webinar, which is actually meant to provide um, an overview of uh, all the topics that will be dealt with uh, in this session. And we're very privileged, very privileged to have an imminent set of panels and panelists uh, who will be sort of walking us through uh, the different elements in which uh, DSI is relevant, uh, both from a technical scientific point of view and of course, uh, policy uh, point of view. Um, so this uh, session will be structured as follows. We will have an introduction uh, and I will introduce the panelists sequentially. Uh, we'll have an introduction on what DSI is and what it's not basically, uh, how DSI is produced, how DSI is stored and managed, and what are the application of DSI uh, in relation to the CBD. And for this, uh, we will, as I said, uh, sort of have uh, panelists who have been uh, working on this session, on this issue uh, quite actively. Uh, and I'd like to, uh, without further ado, to uh, introduce our first panelist, uh, who will be Margot Bigley who will uh, discuss what is DSI and what it's not and in terms of options and view. Margot uh, is an ASA uh, Greek Scandal Professor of Law at Emory University School of Law, where she teaches patent law and other intellectual property law courses and is a face that's familiar and a voice that's familiar in the area of DSI, has contributed to uh, many of the discussions at the international level. Um, so. Uh, someone who needs uh, very little introduction. So Margot, the floor is yours um, for your presentation on this first part of the webinar. Thank you, Olivier, uh, for the introduction. And um, I'll say I'm delighted to be here to be able to speak on this topic today. What is DSI and what is it not? Or um, probably more accurately what DSI might be and what it might not be since we really don't have definitive answers on this question yet. All right, so um, I wanted to start by noting that DSI is relevant for the three objectives of uh, the CBD. Um, other speakers will be focusing on uh, the first two objectives and um, I think most of the controversy probably relates to the impact of DSI on the third objective, the fair and equitable sharing of benefits um, resulting from the utilization of genetic resources. And this comes from a growing concern that DSI utilization will negatively um, affect benefit sharing by allowing users to bypass access and benefit sharing obligations because they may no longer need to use tangible or physical material um, in order to develop important, valuable products. Um, and so sequences from the tangible material can be used in place of the um, 
tangible material itself. And uh, just for two quick examples, just from the last month articles um, that talk about the production of high value products without the need for tangible material. Researchers from Osaka University in Japan have engineered a biosynthetic pathway to produce in yeast a route um, for industrial manufacture of saponins, which are found naturally in a variety of plants and have a variety of therapeutic effects useful in drug development. Um, similarly, another recent article, again, just from last month, summarizes a variety of techniques used to develop biosynthetic alternatives to various high value compounds. So the fact that sequence information can be used um, in these ways, again, without tangible material, is, is leading to uh, this conversation that we're seeing in the context of the CBD and the Nagoya Protocol on DSI. So I will now briefly discuss what DSI is or might be um, and what it might not be as, again, I mentioned we don't have definitive answers to these questions. I'll just go back as far as February of 2018, the first uh, DSI ATEG um, that was um, charged with looking at the question of what is DSI and the terminology came up with a list of possible things that could be included as DSI. I did not agree on any of them. In fact, um, the only real agreement I think coming out of that ATEG was that um, DSI is probably not the best term, um, but that it would be used as a placeholder for the time being. That led to decision 1420 at COP14 in Sharm el -Sheikh which affirmed that DSA may not be the most appropriate term, but is used as a placeholder until an alternative term um, is agreed upon. Um, but decision 1420 also established a science and policy-based process for looking into the question of DSI and provided for the commissioning of four studies um, on various aspects of DSI. The first study, which looked at concept and scope really was very helpful um, in laying out the flow of information that comes from and can be derived from genetic resources um, and could possibly comprise DSI. And this was relied on, I think quite heavily by the 2020 ATEG in creating groups of information, subject matter that could possibly comprise DSI with the groups being cumulative, starting most narrowly with DNA and RNA, um, expanding that to proteins and epigenetic modifications, expanding that further to metabolites and other macromolecules, all that could possibly uh, be comprised within uh, DSI based on um, the relationship to the underlying genetic resource and the degree of biological processing required. There was another column, associated information, associated with genetic resources like traditional knowledge, for example, um, to say that is not, well, that's the proposal coming out of the 2020 ATED, that DSI is not associated information, but could possibly be um, some, some, some subset of groups one and two, one, two, and three that were identified by the ATED. Um, the ATIC also identified a plethora of terms that could be used as opposed to DSI, did not exclude the possibility of, of still coming up with DSI at the end, but terms for each of these groups. Um, and noted that technological developments could lead to a change in the subject matter within the scope of DSI. And, for that reason, it's important to have flexible terminology to account for the possibility of rapid technological advances. And there was just an article yesterday about how um, artificial intelligence had cracked a 50 year old problem of um, how proteins fold, which leads to an understanding of their function and um, will be very important, one would expect, for uh, designing new medicines and products um, that will have high value and high importance to society and may 
come up with new terms that we haven't really thought about or really been aware of right now. An important question that arises when we're talking about DSI is whether it is even within the scope of the CBD and Nagoya protocol. And there are two primary, primary approaches that we see here. Um, one with some um, countries, some parties saying that DSI is a genetic resource. It comes within the definition of genetic resources from the CBD. Others saying that it results directly or indirectly from the utilization of genetic resources. That these are the two primary ways that we would conclude that DSI is within the scope of the CBD and Nagoya protocol and therefore um, relevant to its objectives. Um, just as a quick reminder, genetic resources, the definition that we have, um, it means genetic material and material sounds somewhat tangible. Um, so, it doesn't seem as though DSI is, is the best fit, perhaps, um, for coming within the definition of genetic resources. Nevertheless, um, there was a 2010 study that said it, it could possibly um, come within that definition if you look at the spirit um, of the uh, CBD and Nagoya protocol and what was intended. Utilization of genetic resources, biotechnology, I won't go into those. Those are, again, from the actual agreements. But it, it is important which approach you take. The fourth study um, that came out of decision 1420 was a fact-finding study on how domestic measures address benefit sharing arising from uses of DSI. And that study identified um, countries that were taking both of these approaches, some interpreting genetic resources to include DSI and requiring prior informed consent, mutually agreed terms, some countries not imposing access requirements, just imposing benefit sharing obligations on the use of DSI. And um, as, I, as I said, the implications are very important. If you say that DSI is a genetic resource, then it's subject to pick and mat. And so there could be access limitations, which as the other speakers um, will uh, talk about, I'm sure can create problems in terms of timing hampering scientific developments, um, bilateral negotiations seem to be particularly problematic and not conducive uh, to the ways that DSI is used and the difficulties in tracing and detecting uses of DSI. Um, the OTEG did note that there could be flat fee access or licensing approaches possible, but um, that is a fairly contentious issue. Um, if, however, we say that DSI results from the utilization of genetic resources, um, that would allow us to avoid access limitations. Um, benefit sharing would still be required, um, but it could be accomplished via a variety of approaches um, triggered by utilization or commercialization or a global multilateral benefit sharing mechanism. Um, I have here, and this is just for later for, for reference, um, why this is so. Um, why, if you define it as a genetic resource, um, you would have access restrictions potentially, and why, if you just say utilization, only benefit sharing is required. So to conclude, there are um, several possibilities for the scope of DSI or the terminology of the subject matter um, that were identified by the OTEG in 2020. It's important for technology to be flexible enough, I'm sorry, for terminology to be flex flexible enough to accommodate technological developments. Um, there are additional issues, including how we classify DSI as a genetic resource or as resulting from utilization. And the current panoply of different domestic approaches to DSI scope and classification suggest a need for this issue to be resolved at the international level. So thank you, and I will stop there. Thank you very much, Margot, for this uh, first presentation, which I think was uh, quite rich in terms of providing a little bit of a background uh, as regards to uh, some of the discussions that have uh, happened in relation to defining DSI, in relation to sort of ascribing a scope to DSI, what the different implications are, uh, stating, of course, that uh, uh, however one classify or cluster this issue of digital sequence information, has significant implication in terms of uh, processes that uh, we're dealing with here with regards to the CBD, the Naga protocol in particular, and also for highlighting some of the uh, sort of avenues in terms of, you know, uh, defining uh, terminology 
that could best uh, fit the purpose of advancing uh, discussions uh, with regards to this very important questions. And most importantly, Mar uh, Margot also, uh, thank you for sticking to your time, which I know uh, is not evident and I hope the other panelists will follow suit. Uh, just before we move on to the next panelist, I'd like to also remind participants um, that of course, there's interpretation in this webinar and that they can uh, basically click uh, on the uh, interpretation signal with which is basically um, sort of the, the globe of the world uh, sort of signal there. And then you will sort of be able to choose uh, the language in which you would like to follow for those who have not been able to uh, do so uh, since the beginning. So um, with this, um, We'll move on to uh, now another sort of stream uh, to our discussion uh, following this, uh, this introduction um, to uh, how DSI is produced. Uh, and we're very uh, uh, privileged to have with us uh, Dr. Val Husson, who is an independent senior researcher, um, research fellow, sorry, at the University of Aberdeen in the UK. Uh, he's been the recipient of the prestigious 1.3 million pounds fellowship award from the Engineering and Physical Science Research Council. Um, he's co-authored more than 45 research articles and he's a member of the research team who conducted the CBD fact finding study on the concept and scope of digital, digital sequence information on genetic resources. And basically his current research aims at recru um, recruiting an engineering novel biosynthetic enzymes that can catalyze challenging chemical transformation involved in drug synthesis. So we're very pleased uh, Al, that you have been, uh, uh, that you have accepted to join us to provide some uh, insights on this uh, question of how DSI is produced. So I'll give you the floor right away so that uh, you can go, um, go ahead with your presentation. Thank you, Val. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, do you hear me? And uh, do you ca can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Uh, well, you can. You may proceed. Okay. Thank you very much. So, thanks, Olivia, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. I'd like to start by thanking um, the organizing committee for this webinar. In the next 10 minutes or so, I will, uh, I'm going to give you an overview on how is digital sequence information or DSI produced. Before I start, I will just um, uh, give you, um, uh, highlight to you these two uh, uh, references. Um, the first is a CBD effect finding study conducted by myself, Rodrigo and Marcel Jaspers. And it is on the concept scope and the current use of DSI. And the other one is the Deep uh, Ocean Stewardship uh, Initiative Policy Brief, which is derived from uh, or based on this study, but gives you um, uh, the main points uh, addressed. And the links for the two studies are uh, present here for your reference. And before we go, I'd like to go through some basics. And the first of which is the central dogma of molecular biology. So we know, as you can see, as you have seen in the video, that is all the genetic information for any organism is stored on a molecule called DNA or deoxyribonucleic acid. This is going to be transcribed, the process of transcription to RNA or ribonucleic acid. And the RNA gives rise, or the code on the RNA is translated to proteins. These proteins or enzymes usually catalyze many reactions in the organism body and is responsible for producing the metabolites at the end. So they basically convert the nutrients that is taken by the organism to proteins, carbohydrates, lipids that is going to construct the body of the organism and let it grow. And these what we call it primary metabolites. These are carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins. However, there is another set of metabolites called secondary metabolites. If we think about, for example, morphine that is produced by a plant called the papathosomenifrum, or penicillin, the antibiotic penicillin that's produced by the fungus penicillium notatum. Penicillin here is a secondary metabolite. It is produced mainly to protect the fungus from any surrounding bacteria uh, so that they don't share the nutrients with the fungus. If we look in depth into this, so you can see this, the structure of the DNA. So 
the structure of the DNA is a double helix, and you can see the backbone of that is deoxyribose sugar and phosphate group. And it's also containing four bases, the cyamine, which is T here, adenine, cytosine, and guanine. The, in, in, if the cyamine is in one strand, it complements adenine in the other strand. And if cytosine is in one strand, it complements always the guanine base. It is a sequence of these four bases that is, represents the code of the genetic information present in, in any one organism. This is followed by the RNA, so after the transcription, the code in the DNA is gonna be transcribed into a similar code on the RNA. So what's the difference? The RNA backbone forms of ribose sugar rather than deoxyribose sugar in the DNA. And phosphate group again, and the four bases are the same except the four thiamine, which is being converted to uracil in the, uh, in the um, RNA. Now, this code is going to be converted to protein. So every three bases in the RNA is going to be called codon and is going to encode for one amino acid in the protein. So AUG is converted to methionine or encodes a methionine amino acid, and the AEG encodes lysine, and so on. So if we look at that, we have four bases, and any three combinations represent one codon. So all the iterations could be representing 64 codons in total. And these will include the 20 natural amino acids. And these iterations are present on what we call the codon wheel. The way we read it is that as we start from the central circle to the outside circle and in one direction. So you say, for example, UAU is a, 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 a tyrosine amino acid, while UUC represent the phenyl anine or includes the phenyl anine. You will notice that is the AUG, AUG, includes methionine amino acid, but it also represents a start codon or call it a start codon because it tells the ribosome where to start the process of the, trans um, of the translation. We equally have stop codons. These are the signals that is, tells the ribosome where to stop or terminate the, the senses of the protein. We have to understand that the genetic code is degenerate, is that many amino acids can be encoded by different codons. For example, here you can see CUU and CUC and CUA and CUG all encodes leucine. And this means that it's different, I mean, different DNA sequences can give rise to the same protein. And each organism has a preference for using a specific codon for a specific amino acid. Moving from that, so how is digital sequence information produced? So this is the central dogma, as we said, DNA to protein to, uh, to, to RNA to protein to metabolite. And the origin of that is the genetic source. Definitely the genetic source is any matter, anything that is containing a nucleic acid, okay? so whether it is living or not, and any samples that's containing nucleic acid, basically. And you can extract the DNA, you can extract the RNA, you can extract the protein, the total protein, and also the metabolites included in the sample. You need to do a lot of research in order to convert this simple physical samples to extract the information from these physical samples. So for example, you need for the genetic material, you can do anatomical studies, you can do uh, microscopical studies to identify whether it is a pure organism or it contains contaminants, for example, or in, it, it is living in symbiosis with other symbionts. Uh, and this will be uh, uh, giving you a lot of metadata. However, for the DNA, you have also to do, you can get the sequence of the DNA, this is a sequence of the bases, but also there are lots of, the sequence itself doesn't tell you much, but it is the information, the studies that is being done after that will lead to understand the function of each gene in the DNA and uh, whether it is correlated to as And what is the function annotation? This requires a lot of studies. Similarly, 
of the RNA, we have lots of techniques that is, for example, here, the microarray, it tells you how much RNA is produced by specific organism. Um, Oliver, is that okay? Um, sorry, I can't hear you. Just saying you still have four minutes, about four minutes left. Four minutes? Yes, please. Okay, okay. Okay, so this is gene exhibition profiling, how much uh, each gene is converted to a protein, how much protein is produced by each gene. And finally, the proteins as well. It is not the sequence of the proteins that tells you much, but it is a, basically the 3D structure of the protein, which underlies the function of this protein. And the, finally, the metabolite, you need the structure of the metabolite and possibly the biological activity. And in knowing all, the, so we have physical samples, we have techniques here, but we have information here. And this, this leads to a lot of application. So this is the difference between the raw sequence, the DNA sequence, as I said, it doesn't tell you much, or the protein sequence, it doesn't tell you much. For example, it doesn't tell you what's the function of the each gene. It doesn't tell you the middle of exhibition from each gene. It doesn't tell you, if, for example, if you know the protein sequence, it doesn't tell you how the protein falls. And is this, for example, misfolded proteins that can lead to a specific disease, for example, Alzheimer or um, uh, cystic fibrosis. Or it doesn't tell you about the post-translational modification. So after the protein is produced, some, it can be glycosylated, it can be phosphorylated, and all these modifications cannot be predicted from the sequence. This is just a, a glimpse of our overview of the techniques that is um, being used for sequencing DNA. There are too many platforms, but they differ, differ, differ in the throughput. Some of them are high throughput, and some of them are low throughput. But also, the, 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 the length of the read and the accuracy as well is making the difference between them. What I want to say here is that the sequence, of course, decreases tremendously. It becomes faster, cheaper. But this leads to an, uh, that's tremendous amount of data that is generated, and this needs a management of data. So what's being sequenced? The whole genome of the organism, or a metagenome if the organism contains lots of symbionts. For example, the DNA is a combination of all the DNA of all these represented organisms. And also some of the specific genes that is, can be amplified in order to give an idea about the identity of the organism. And we can put the sequence of these umbilicons in the database and to see how relative of this organism to the other organisms in the database. And the environmental DNA, this is a physical sample. It could be a soil sample. You give the DNA, the organism is not there. There is no living organism. It is just the DNA and you sequence it. Examples of the application of DSI, it could be used for taxonomical identification. For example, the DNA barcoding, you have the organism, you get the DNA, and use that as a barcode, like the one that is used in the shop for, the, for any goods. And this can be identity for the organism. The biodiversity conservation, you need to know the, 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 the biodiversity present in any one environment to, to, to actually uh, put the measures to how to protect the, uh, and to conserve the biodiversity in this specific environment. Agriculture and food security, for example, we can use genetic markers to assess selective breeding. We need to keep that, or for example, development of genetically modified organisms. In drug discovery, for example, identification of new drug targets. So if we see that a certain gene is upregulated in a specific disease, this means that the protein included could be a target for drug discovery. Medicine, detection of infectious pathogens, and in uh, the biotechnology, by recombinant the production of proteins, for example, a production of insulin or uh, the enzymes for laundry detergents. By this, I think I have reached the end of my talk. I hope that this is would be useful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Val. Uh, it has been more than useful. I think it has been very, very rich and. Uh, Sure, there will there will be some questions, and uh, with regards to some of the the, the content that's described therein, um, just to remind participants also that, uh, of course, you can uh, post your questions uh, uh, in uh, the Q and A function, uh, which will be filtered, and uh, because of the time that we have and the number of participants, uh, it's very important that uh, so you you list your question. You can also uh, with this function. 
uh, also mention, uh, you can like some of the questions if they are similar to the ones that you wanted to raise. Uh, and so that uh, the questions that are in will be to, during the limited time that we have. Um, so Val, thank you very much for uh, walking us through some of the so some of the ways in which the DSI is produced and some of the applications and some of the uh, also implications once we have uh, this understanding of the different sectors, different applications. Uh, I think this is very useful um, and builds on uh, is a very, very well on what has been already uh, addressed by Margo with regards to sort of uh, the scope and terminologies terminology, sorry, uh, as to uh, how this issue is being discussed. So um, I'd like without further ado to sort of move on and uh, introduce um, our next panelist who will um, you know, continue uh, on that we're trying to sort of generate through these building blocks, uh, who is uh, Guy Cochrane, who is the head of the European Nuclear uh, Archive at ENA. Um, who has been the head of the European Nuclear Archive at uh, EMBLLB. Uh, he leads the team that provides in addition data coordination tool, ad services across a range of scientific areas such as livestock, infectious disease, environmental omics, biodiversity and human health. Uh, so he has been really uh, dealing uh, at the core of uh, this issue of how DSI is stored and managed. And without further ado, um, Gad, I'd like to give you the floor uh, to uh, uh, proceed with your presentation. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much, Olivier. Uh, and thank you to the ABS Capacity Developments Initiative uh, for this opportunity to speak that I very much welcome. And, and hello to, to, to everybody. So this is a DNA sequence. And if you're not a scientist who's used to looking at uh, sequences such as this, then this will make very little sense. But actually, even if you are a scientist who's used to looking at sequences like this, then it will also make very little sense. Um, it only makes sense when you start to compare it and contrast it to existing sequences from a whole host of different organisms. Um, there's very little about the sequence itself that can tell you anything without access to the sequence that has come before. So that can be direct, one could do direct comparisons, and it can be indirect. There can be tools that one uses to analyze sequence, but those tools are informed by patterns that are observed by looking at the existing body of sequences. So even when you've done that, you've compared and you've contrasted your sequence, you found some things out about your sequence. Um, it's very unlikely that your sequence will, be, will lead to any um, massive scientific discovery. The next scientific um, discovery will not is very unlikely to come from this from any one sequence. What's most likely is that the sequence will contribute something, some piece of information, some signal that will contribute along with tens, hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands of other sequences to some scientific understanding. And so science will emerge, but science will emerge by gathering the sequences together and putting together these sequence, these signals from the different sequences. And so the scientific story could be told, but it may well not be told for another 10 or 20 years or even further into the future. And so a sequence in isolation cannot be interpreted and, and is unlikely to be informative. And for this reason, scientists from the beginning of sequencing back in the 1970s and 1980s have thought about collecting sequences together. And the main way of working with sequence is to group sequences into large collections such that one can carry out these comparisons, one can integrate new sequence, and one can look at the scientific uh, information and the knowledge that can emerge from the, this complete um, accessible set. And so I'm gonna talk about the, uh, the system that is used around the world to manage sequence data that enables this collection to be constructed. And I would like you to think about this, not so much as a set of web servers and databases and files and, and so on, but rather as a process through which one takes these rather raw, uh, rather uninformative sequences and enables information from those in the context of everything else that's already known to become usable and valuable to society. So the, and incidentally, I have many things on my slides. I'm not going to cover everything, but the slides will be available afterwards uh, for people who wish to look further into some of the details. So the, the International Nuclear Sequence Database Collaboration, the INSDC, 
is the organization that from the, the start of sequencing has looked after managing and organizing and, and assisting uh, sequencing data. It's run by three different institutes, one in Europe, as we've heard before, one in Europe, one in the US, and my organization, the European Bioinformatics Institute, part of the um, EMBL uh, in Europe. And it really serves to make data uh, openly available uh, to everybody. It's globally comprehensive. It spans all life science domains, everything from humans to model organisms, laboratory organisms, uh, to, to biodiverse species. And it's a permanent database of record. And it has become very much the forum through which the scientific process is discussed and, and, and through which scientific discovery um, is, is, is mediated. Uh, it's well established, I won't say so much more about it. Our actual work is about data standards and data exchange, um, coming up with accessioning systems that really work at, at the scale at which we work, and working very much with the literature publication process, which is very important to science, to make sure that there are sequences uh, that are connected to the literature where the, the production and the use of those sequences is described. So everything happens at a great scale and everything is growing. Here, just suffice it to say that, that we measure our sequences in the billions and we have many far bigger raw data sets and a new data set hits the database once every six minutes. Um, so this is a massive piece of infrastructure, hundreds of petabytes of data storage, um, and it takes a lot to, to keep this running. Something like a $50 million uh, US dollar investment a year. We have lots of biodiversity data in there. And you can see on the right how, for example, the geolocated data have grown over the, uh, over the four decades. So people come to the database with new data they've just generated. So these will be scientists, labs, uh, public health institutions, uh, museums, many, many different types of, of, of individual involved and group involved in sequencing. And they push their data into the system. Now that is much more than simply an upload of some data files. That is a process that takes the, the, the submitter through data validation, organization and curation of the data and the addition of structure um, that will ultimately enable the data the sequence to be integrated into the whole. It's a process through which the, the, the data submitter is run through a set of data standards, um, community data standards that, that understand the requirements of, of what one captures around the sequence data and the structures for the sequence data. Um, and that compliance is a process that ultimately also enables the integration and the reusability of the sequence. Um, and then, of course, there are, there's further decoration of the sequence, the addition of links to external data, to items in collections, to places in the world, and indeed to the scientific literature. So that's the handover point. Once that data submission is finished, it's handed over to the database. And there we have further curation processes and the integration with the overall corpus of data begins. At that point, there is then indexing. So uh, systems uh, run through the data as a whole uh, to make things searchable uh, and reusable and make them um, highly uh, interoperable so that one can work across large data sets, even though they come from different places. Um, and then these are provided openly and freely to the world. So, so openly and freely means that no one has to pay at the point of access. Uh, no one has to register. You just go to websites um, and you can, you can pick up the data or you go to various uh, online services to pick up the data. So we have these open services. Many people use the data directly. Um, one way of measuring that is to look at literature publications that cite sequences. It's not, the, it's not the only way of looking at this, but it's one way. And we count something like 1,600 publications every month uh, where uh, people are using existing sequence in the database, often adding their own sequence as well. Just five examples here, one in um, uh, comparative genomics, evolutionary biology here. Um, this is uh, related to agriculture, related to environmental pollution, in, in, in related to animal health. And so in each of these studies, there has been uh, sometimes some new sequencing, but people have been, the people running the studies have been to the public databases, been to INSDC, found data of relevance, and used these as part of their analysis. But that's really only the start of it, the direct use. Immediately what happens when data become public in the INSDC system, they are autonomously, so without any human involvement, they run through different propagation systems to allow those data to flow and to be connected into, into a myriad of, of further databases. And so this is INSDC on the top right here. And this wheel 
each of the bands are from, from um, INSDC shows a connection or a data flow to another database. Uh, and each of these databases, each of these databases is a specialist in some particular area. It adds curation, analysis processes, uh, quality control. And, and so what we're doing is we're propagating data and allowing those data to be enriched and made useful for particular applications. Now, what I'm showing here are the different databases that belong to the set that is, is called the Elixir Core Data Resources. It's a European set of, of the, larger, um, uh, the larger database players in the sphere. <clears throat> but we can go further and we can look globally. And we know of some 2,000 almost uh, uh, databases um, that, that deal with, um, with molecular biology information. Um, and uh, 800 of those focus on sequence data. Uh, most of those are not dealing with, with human data. So 743 here, this is the number that are um, dealing with relevant sequences that include those that are relevant to biodiversity uh, sequencing. Um, and only 38 of these, at 2.4% of those, allow upload outside the INSDC system. But actually, they, they still connect into it. They still use the accessioning system. And there's only a tiny percent, less than 0.4%, less than are not connected to INSDC. And so we're seeing that 800 or so databases uh, cluster around um, the, the INSDC databases and immediately do things with sequence and make it more usable, make it more valuable, uh, and drive at the scientific uh, application of those data. Everything is open and it's the openness about the data that enable this connection to happen. So this, this value can emerge because the data are open. The terms of use are very light. Uh, people put their data in, they remain the owners of the data. They may have rights associated with the data and constraints on how the data are used that could be to do with ABS, uh, could be uh, for other reasons, um, but that isn't controlled within the system. The, the sequences are made openly available to all comers. Now, I want to step, this isn't quite so on topic for, for biodiversity per se, perhaps, um, but I want to just give an example because COVID-19 is obviously very prominent in, in, in all of our minds. And these are numbers taken from um, the, uh, the, the European COVID-19 data platform that we're running from the European Bioinformatics Institute. Um, and we look at how open data within less than a year have been able to contribute a huge depth uh, to our scientific understanding. And so here we have, of course, sequences, but we have uh, human, uh, human data from, from patients infected with the virus. We have expression data, protein sequences and structures. You can see some protein structures here, um, uh, uh, biochemical data, pathways, compounds, and so on. And so this is a combination of, of data relating to COVID-19 that have been produced in response to the outbreak and the pandemic. Um, but it's also those data sets from other coronaviruses from human response systems that are really important in understanding the biology. And the fact that we could put this together so quickly, it's something like 300,000 different biomolecular records, really um, attests that the, the, public, the open data made publicly available are, re are really critical. Without the openness, we wouldn't be able to do this kind of thing. And just to point out, there's a lot of talk, of course, now about um, the vaccines, the Pfizer vaccine, the first one to be announced with, with, with some results. Um, if you go and look at the report, then very early on, it's all based on, on, on this MN908947.3. That's an accession number from the INSDC system. And so it's used without open data. This, this, this uh, actually the first three vaccines that we've heard about will not be, uh, would not have been possible. Uh, so finally, I just want to mention something that is perhaps not what one would expect. Um, data collection around the world is, is global. People produce sequences. Uh, from, from everywhere in the world, and they consume sequences everywhere in the world. But the flow of benefit is not necessarily what one might expect. Uh, it's not necessarily from the biodiverse countries towards other countries. Uh, in fact, it's much more balanced. So the map on the top, we're looking at the, the, the uh, production of uh, sequences. So the, the darker the color, the more sequences are produced from organisms in, in, the, in the particular country that's shown. So this is about where the organism was, not where it was sequenced, maybe somewhere else. What the organism was. And so we see actually a lot of them are produced in, 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 um, in, in, in developed countries, in, in, in um, high income countries. When you look at consumption, of course we have far bigger numbers here, it's a much, e much more even picture. Consumption is everywhere and what starts to appear, you see some dropouts of countries that, that, that are big producers not consuming so much and you see other countries appearing that 
that, that don't produce so much, but they, they consume a lot more. So the flow isn't from, from low and middle income countries to high income countries. It's a much more balanced system than that. And so with that, I, I thank you for your attention and I, I finish. Thank you, Guy, for a very, very interesting and again, rich presentation and uh, that sort of shed some lights also with regards to um, the issues that we're discussing when we're dealing with DSI. And, uh, and I find it particularly insightful, um, uh, the distinction that you made with regards to uh, uh, direct use in terms of access to some of the database and uh, uh, data sets with regards to DSI and uh, further propagation of data into other database, the process that's followed, um, sort of what is actually sort of happening there from a scientific point of view and what actually, what kind of data is actually being shared and, and the means to which, and the useful example, of course, of uh, uh, a direct application to what we're all living uh, through right now with uh, COVID-19 and and, uh, and also the, the sort of the um, enshrined principle uh, that uh, sort of uh, premise open access, which uh, is still what we're functioning under uh, within these uh, databases. So I think very useful, and I'm sure there'll be uh, lots of questions with regards to all of the points, uh, very useful points that you raised. And with this, I'd like to uh, invite uh, our last panelist who will um, uh, focus on what are the application of DSA DSI, sorry, in relation to uh, the CBD. Um, so we have the honor of having Amber Schultz who will be providing that presentation. Uh, she has been working at the intersection of science and policy in California and the US federal government, including the White House Office of Science and Technology and Policy uh, at the Leibniz Institute, uh, DSMZ, uh, the German Collection for Microorganism and Cell Culture. Uh, Amber heads up the international strategic activities with a focus on ABS and DSI uh, issues, including the process that led uh, uh, DSMZ becoming the first registered collection under the EU implementation of the NAGLA protocol. So we're very pleased to, to welcome you, Amber, and uh, please uh, proceed with your presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Olivier. I hope you all can see the slides. I'm going to pick up more or less where Guy left off and just give you a funnel of the downstream use that would have happened, so to speak, right outside of that, those databases that Guy explained and pick up on those interconnections. <clears throat> so the first, as has already been mentioned, DSI does and enables a lot of public good. So here's pictures, but unfortunately, we don't have time to go through all of these examples. So what I'd like to do is give you three examples and I wanna focus them on the three goals of the CBD since that's where this discussion is taking place today. And for each example, what I'd like to do is tell you what the DSI is used for, what the scientific question is that's being asked. And I wanna tell you a little bit about the technical way that this scientific question was answered. So the first goal of the CBD, Biodiversity conservation. How is DSI used for biodiversity conservation? And here I have two sub examples. Number one, identifying new species, and we do that through barcoding. And number two, unknown sequences, where it comes from a species, but we don't know a lot about it. So if you want to conserve biodiversity, I think it's understandable that you can only protect and conserve what you know you have. How? We do this through barcoding. So if you look at the beige spaces on this map, these are places where we have very little information on the animal diversity in those countries. That means that for scientists, for biologists trying to conserve biodiversity, their ability to do that in these beige colored or light colored countries is very limited because the species inventories are not enough for us to understand who's there. So how does DNA barcoding work? Perhaps you've heard this word. You start with some organism that you can't identify, that you've never seen before, that you want to know more about. You have to crunch up maybe all of it if it's a bug or maybe part of it if it's a plant. You extract through physical and chemical means the DNA. You amplify one piece of the larger genome. So you amplify one piece that will be your barcode fragment. You sequence it using the methods that YL explained earlier, and then you compare that sequence in a large database and say, aha, 
I hopefully found a match, maybe a hundred percent match. And that says that species is the same one as the one that it matched 100% to. For different organisms, there are different genes that we use to ask what is the name of this organism. So the map I showed you on the previous slide is for animals, and that's where we use the CO1 gene. For plants, we often use a gene called rubisco, for fungi, something called ITS. For um, non-eukaryotic um, organisms, we use a gene called 16S, and for microbial eukaryotes, we often use 18S. You don't need to remember these, it's just to tell you that we have lots of tricks for different kinds of organisms to ask, what is your name? It's also important to remember here, here we're not actually interested in the function of the gene, but rather we just use these, these barcodes to give us a name tag, like I'm Amber, you're Bob, she's Sally. It doesn't tell us about that person's personality, about what they can do, it only says your name is Sally. And that's good for us because then we can tell what the species are in a given country or in a given environment. These barcodes are only possible through large databases. And as Guy suggested, these are also integrated into this core infrastructure. So here's an example for animal sequences, 22,000 users from 200 nations with a million site visitors per year. These are 7 million barcodes of different animals that are used and referenced against about a half a million known species. The other cool thing about barcodes is that beyond just identifying new species, we can also do other useful things like identify invasive species, recognize pests and pathogens, and also identify contaminants in food or in water so that we can say, aha, this is cholera, that's why you're getting sick. The other interesting thing for biodiversity scientists is when we find a new species, a new bacteria, it's often true that we don't know what those, that, that organism can do. And so when we go beyond the barcode and we look at the rest of the genome, as Guy told you at the beginning of his talk, these letters mean nothing. And what we know is that the more we know, the better we're, we're, we are able to understand what the rest of the genome can do, what the organism is functionally capable of. So if you look on the y-axis, this is the proportion of unknown or hypothetical genes, which means these genes are basically babble. They say blah, 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 blah. They don't mean anything to us. And if that organism has a lot of related genomes in the databases, then amount of, of ununderstandable things is only about one in four. So 25% of the genome we don't understand. But if there's a lot of um, unknown in it, about three out of four, that's because there are no known relatives. This means for biodiversity reachers, we have to have one big central database in order to increase our chances of understanding biodiversity. So goal two, sustainable use of biological diversity. And here the example is comparing DSI sequences to reduce pollution. And this example I borrowed directly from Marcus Weiss at DSM. Our goal here is to improve water quality and in particular by decreasing phosphorus pollution. So here's a polluted lake. <clears throat> and here, one of the causes of this polluted lake is perhaps some form of non-ruminous livestock. So like a pig who, when it excretes, pr produces, excretes 100% of the organic phosphate because it doesn't have the genes in its body or the right kinds of microbes to be able to access uh, organic phosphate. And that means it all comes out in the manure and then it can run into a lake like this. And so what DSM wanted to do was to, to, to solve or to work on this problem. So there were already companies, for example, that had food with phytases in them to make the amount of phosphate that came out the back end of the pig lower. But what DSM said is, you know what, we have this problem because the farmers actually like to give the pigs these pellet forms. They eat them better, they're easier to transport, whatever. But when we push them through this pellet making machine, that phytase that we put in up here actually breaks down. And so we don't have a very big impact on the amount of phosphate pollution. And so what we need to do is make that more heat stable so that we have less phosphate come out the backside. So how did they do that? Well, they used a lot of different sequences. They, they searched the databases for phytases. They found 153 that they really liked for whatever biological reason, or maybe that's all the phytases they had available to them. 
and they developed a new phytase into a commercial product. And what they did is they compared at every single column here where there's different colors, those are different kinds of proteins at each position. And they developed a consensus strain here along the bottom where they said, let's take the, the most common letter at each position and make a merge of all of these sequences to make what turned out to be a more heat stable phytase that they could then add into the pig food. I hope you see from this example that the R&D process is actually nonlinear, that lots of actors contribute a little bit. They started where there were already companies that had added phytases into food, and they figured out a way to increase thermostability. And determining what is decisive for the value generation can be very difficult. Goal three, fair and equitable benefit sharing. And since Guy also had the last example of the coronavirus, I will take the liberty to do the same, using synthetic biology to fight a pandemic fast. The goal here is to respond to a pandemic by developing a diagnostic kit. Here's the front page of Spiegel online here in Germany back in January of uh, 2020 at the beginning of this year, seems like a lifetime ago. And here is an example from the European Virus Archive, which is a European funded project to offer a viral infrastructure, a viral collection that was in the right place at the right time to be able to offer diagnostic reagents to the world after the outbreak of the coronavirus. So on January 10th, Chinese researchers uploaded the first known genome of SARS-CoV-2 into the INSDC. A couple of weeks later, German researchers were able to synthesize based upon the viral genome, the virus itself. A virus, remember, is a piece of bad news wrapped up in protein. And because of this feature, it is possible for scientists to actually synthesize a virus. I note this is only possible for viruses, not for all other kinds of organisms. Some people think a, a virus is actually not an organism, but that's not for my debate. And then they were able to offer this virus directly in the EVA catalog. Then the researchers at Charité in Berlin identified a gene that is unique and stable. They were able to do that because a unique gene has to be compared to all other viruses in the world, right? You don't want to be diagnosed with corona when you actually have herpes. You want to make sure that you have a gene that is unique to this specific pathogen. You also have to find a stable gene by comparing it to multiple patient samples, because if the gene evolves rapidly, then the diagnostic kit will soon become irrelevant. And in order to do that, you also need to have a large data set and some pretty interesting prior knowledge, some good experience. The first diagnostic kits were shipped on February 9th by the EVA um, consortium. And then a few months later, commercial companies were then able to develop test kits um, based upon the original ideas put forth by the German colleagues. And this test kit is still available and can be purchased for, or can be um, ordered for free through the EVA catalog. If you want to know more about the biology behind this, this is a great link to get you started on the, the bio biological pieces. <clears throat> Over the last nine months, our EVA colleagues have sent this diagnostic kits around the world for free. And it's hard, an interesting question whether or not this is actually monetary benefit sharing or non-monetary benefit sharing. All customers here that you see had the free option available to them, but some declined because they felt they might get the diagnostic kit faster or that it might have changed their use rights. But all of the countries here that are either purple or red received free material that was directly funded by the EU Commission to the tune of multiple millions of dollars. And a total of 114 countries have received these diagnostic kits through the EVA consortium to date. So what are the implications that you have heard from these three CPD goal examples? Number one, I hope you understand a little more that DSI is essential for different types of public good and indeed for all three CPD goals. Number two, that modern day biodiversity research depends on DSI, identifying species, learning about unknown biodiversity is absolutely dependent on DSI. Number three, DSI can be commercially utilized. It is commercially utilized, but it is a complex iterative process based on huge data sets. It is very rarely, if never, based on one single special piece of DSI. Number four, it is very common 
to use DSI that was sourced from genetic resources from multiple legal jurisdictions. So if you take the phytase example, well, plants, fungi, organisms in the high seas in Antarctica actually make phytase. So if you want to look at phytases, accidentally, you've accessed many different legal jurisdictions. Number five, if you want to try to de determine benefit sharing credit, which country contributed which portion, good luck. It's gonna be really hard if actually impossible. And that's because lots of sequences contribute to outcomes, contribute to the final result. Some more, some less, but the mathematics behind it would be extraordinarily possible because of the millions and millions of sequences involved. That was it, thank you. Thank you very much, Amber, for this very, again, uh, rich presentation, uh, which I think was uh, very much in line in terms of uh, flow with uh, the previous presentations and uh, provided some uh, very useful um, uh, issues to deal with uh, when considering the uh, DSI. Um, I note, for example, the fact that uh, you kept on, you mentioned and uh, in the presentation and in conclusion with regards to um, the public good aspect of DSI and uh, giving some good uh, uh, background information on this. Um, and I think also one thing to note from your presentation, this issue of uh, uh, the fact that DSI can indeed, of course, be commercially utilized, but uh, noting the iterative process and sequential process in which it's uh, produced and utilized and uh, noting also the complex manner in which these uh, data sets uh, are generated, utilized, and uh, their applications thereof. And I think that's, that's also quite useful uh, with regards to understanding um, what are the, you know, sort of how to circumscribe this issue with, within the benefit sharing uh, sort of discussion. And then, uh, of course, uh, your uh, last set of conclusion with regards to benefit sharing and uh, uh, how difficult it is to, to, to give where credit is due and um, combined with the fact that, of course, uh, the multiple jurisdiction in which DSI is used, uh, created, and also where credit may be sort of due. And I think that's, a, that's quite a critical point to consider when we're dealing with such a complex issue. So thank you very much for uh, all these very insightful um, uh, sort of suggestions and uh, ideas and uh, now I'd like to uh, pass the floor to, to, to Suhel who has been um, sort of looking at some of the questions that have arisen following your respective presentations and the idea here again is not to, to answer all the questions but to, to Suhel, I hope you are successful in that in uh, clustering and uh, categorizing this, uh, this sets of questions so we can actually uh, try as, as we can to answer most of the questions. Yeah, so that, over to you. yeah thanks, uh, Olivier. Yes, I'm Suhel um, Aljanabi, the um, co-manager of the ABS initiative. And uh, so we got tons of questions inside. A lot have been already uh, answered um, in, in writing, but I believe that they were not visible to, to all. Um, and uh, it was a hard choice to pick uh, now some um, that uh, we could now discuss at the, at the panel. So there were, to some extent, very detailed technical questions. As you can picture, there were more conceptual ones and also some um, that did uh, pinpoint at governance questions. Um, uh, as uh, this is indeed now the, the, uh, the balance uh, of the three um, CBD objectives. Um, I would maybe uh, start with some questions that are related to the uh, conceptual understanding and uh, also what, what Amber said uh, and others uh, did um, allude to examples from um, synthetic biology. And uh, is there, let's say, a, delim uh, a delineation uh, where we can say, well, this is where DSI ends and this is where SynBio uh, begins is a matter of utilization because um, uh, the, the CBD is dealing with uh, both concepts and uh, what would be the experts view on that? Well, I can give a short answer. I'm sure that others have opinions. 
and I think I tried to write the answer. I, the important thing for me would be to say, DSI is this big and Synvia was maybe like this big to give you a rough approximation. And what I mean by that, and I hope you heard from the slides, DSI is used by a huge variety of biologists and chemists and geologists and lots of fields. Synthetic biology must use DSI. Without DSI, Synbio can't happen. But the field of biology that needs DSI is a lot bigger than Synbio. So that's just an important relative uh, perspective that I'd like to offer. I'm not a Synbio expert, so I don't want to comment on, on the start and the stop of that. But remember, DSI is used by basically every biologist in the world. I mean, maybe I'm exaggerating. And Synbio is only a small subset of all biologists. Thanks. Anyone to uh, compliment or would you agree? Margot? I agree with what, agree with what Amber said. And, and I think what she really said is that Synbio uses DSI as opposed to being a kind of DSI. Okay, another quite interesting question was, and I think this uh, stems from the very first uh, presentation, um, uh, now on, on the database and data bank structures, there was um, an expression that there is some information which is uh, not included as, as DSI. And I think here we are uh, talking about, um, yes, this at, um, uh, attribute information, and that might be uh, then also seen in um, uh, context with another question, um, for example, when then sequences of uh, plants that are um, hybridized, uh, then uploaded. Um, in that um, country tech, for example, uh, would those uh, then be uh, tagged under country of origin or country of current cultivation? So to the first question, um, that was something that I had mentioned that the 2020 ATEG um, had proposed that the first three groups of information could be included as DSI and the fourth category associated information um, would not be considered uh, DSI, but that is not something that has been finally determined. That is just the proposal of, of the ATEG. And Marcel Jaspers was kind enough to include in the answers to that question a link to the ATEG report. So whoever's interested can go take a look at the report and see the list of the information and on what the ATEG said about that. Right, further comments on, on that question and, and in particular, uh, now the, the second part, uh, which now, uh, if there was a, um, a sequence now uploaded um, from a, um, a hybridized uh, um, plant in plant cultivation, uh, the, the country, uh, country tech, would that reflect the, the country of origin or the country of cultivation? But there's no answer. The person that gets to choose that is the submitting scientist. So as, yeah. as Guy indicated, there are a variety of standardized fields. There's a field called country, and there's a definition that means the source of that biological material. There's a definition I can put in the chat link to clarify that. But if the scientist believes that they took the material from a country, then they would likely, very likely, put the country where they took it from. If they didn't, then they wouldn't. And there is no INSDC police person that goes through and checks whether or not that was done right. It's an, it's, the system right now is an honor system based upon best scientific knowledge. And we put that country information in there primarily, not for the CBD or for the ABS or for the legal world, but because it's really interesting data for scientists to use. That's why the field exists actually, first and foremost. Yes, scientists to use, this is another uh, question that was raised, and it was in particular uh, because, of course, the utilization some uh, assess already as uh, as a benefit. And uh, there was a question now that it was stated that DSI benefits are mainly flowing into the direction um, of north uh, to south. But um, what would be ways to to measure uh, actually these benefits, and also in that regard. Um, 
uh, bearing in mind that research capacities in uh, the south are usually lower than um, in the north, what are means and ways to uh, reinforce capacities in the global south to actually benefit from uh, the, the access to the databases, but also then in terms of uh, um, uh, make, making use in relation to the uh, three objectives. Maybe Guy, that's, that's uh, a good one for you. Thank you, yeah, I'll have a go at that. Um, so yes, the, 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 so I think the point I, I, was, I was trying to make was that the flow of benefit is not necessarily in the direction one might expect. It's not that there's lots of sequencing in, in biodiverse countries and everyone else is using it. Um, it's much more nuanced than that. And the, the slide I showed was data that will be published soon in a paper that's come out of the Wildsy project um, in which Amber is, is, well, which Amber is leading. Um, uh, and so that will, that will show many other things. And they will show actually there are connections between countries where they are sharing, um, where one country will, uh, will have been the source of the sequence. There'll be scientists from, from the, both countries and then third countries as well, collaborating to write the paper. So there's a, there's a lot of network analysis one can do. And the picture really is, is quite nuanced. Um, there are cases where there is flow from, from uh, low middle income countries to um, to wealthier countries and vice versa, but it's that usage is, is very universal. Um, and so I think that the model of open data accessible freely to all is absolutely essential um, for uh, research. And, if, and, and, and accepting that there is a limit in many parts of the world in capacity and infrastructure to do research, um, one at least has a start because one has access to the data. Um, so there are many things that the scientific world does naturally that, that, that are effectively forms of, um, of, of, of non-monetary benefit sharing. Uh, so there's scientific collaboration, engagement, engagement with citizens. Um, uh, sometimes there is investment as well. So I think there are actually many things that, that play into this, that make the benefits of the, these open data more accessible. Um, I think we haven't done a very good job of cataloging them. Um, that hasn't been a focus initially in, in setting all of this up. Um, and I think there is work to be done to have a, a, to understand the, the scale of these kinds of benefits that are already happening. Um, uh, but it doesn't mean to sex enough either. Um, certainly allowing, uh, allowing the, 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 the world fairly to use the data that are being collected uh, is an imp important thing that we need to achieve. Um, but I think one mustn't, one mustn't ignore the fact that that can only happen when one has access to the data. So it's a very important okay. first step. Well, thanks uh, for providing some clarity in that regard. And uh, as, as Val hasn't uh, responded to a question, I think there is maybe one, uh, it's more of a, of a basic understanding what actually one can do with DSI and what not, uh, which is an important question. And uh, this was, uh, uh, so if you knew then uh, the uh, nucleotide uh, sequence of, of a gene would it be possible to recompose simply based on the uh, data that you can retrieve um, uh, uh, from the data banks um, um, the, um, the gene uh, without having access to the um, initial cells uh, and, and, and sources? That's a great question. So um, basically, if you have a DNA sequence, you can basically align the, uh, what we call it open reading frame. So we know from the central dogma where the protein exhibition starts and where it terminates because there is start codon and stop codons. We call this um, sequence in between open reading frame. We can basically do alignment. So we can take every open reading frame and align it in the databases and see whether it matches one of the uh, uh, basically uh, encoded proteins in the database. So we translate the sequence and see whether it matches any sequence of the proteins in the database. And we look at the function of the, of the proteins that is similar to it. So for example, if it is a protease, for example, it's most likely that this particular open reading frame encodes a protease. It depends on the similarity and so on. But if it is a novel sequence, um, uh, then it is it's possibly uh, something that we cannot predict simply from the from the um, from the DNA sequence. Um, hello, do you still hear me? Yes, and, and oh, okay. it was Amber that has hijacked the screen, but which is fine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 
so um, so basically, this is the the, the, the if it, this is can be just solely from the uh, DNA sequence. You can also do something else. So there is what we call it the genome um, wide association studies. So we can look, for example. In, um, in, in if there is a specific uh, gene uh, or set of genes that is all associated with specific populations and show a specific traits or a specific susceptibility to a disease or something like that. This happened by having access to databases and basically having access to this uh, to the sequence. And these studies have lots of, um, there are lots of techniques that's involved in this. Basically, once you have a prediction, you have to confirm it by doing some work in the lab. You may probably uh, try to uh, yeah. create a transgenic animal or something like that, and then look out this particular gene to confirm the function that is you predicted early on. So it is not just, um, it, 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 you can predict something, but you have to confirm it by experiments as well. Yeah, and I think this is also what your slide wanted to show, Amber, isn't it? So yeah. you, you have 30 seconds. Yeah, no, I can do it in less. I mean, you don't need to know this. You just need to know all of these words on the left side are things that synthetic biologists want to be able to do to use DSI to do synthetic biology. And all of the stars, if you see three stars, it means they can do it really well. If you see one star, it means it takes a lot of work and it's very hard to do. And the take home message is you can see lots of places where one star or two stars or three stars depending on the kind of organism, the kind of genetic chassis that you're working in. And the take home message is at the top of the slide, synthetic biology means DSI can reduce, but not replace physical GR. So the answer to your question, Suhel, is yes, sometimes, but not always. And, and that's just the, the, there is no perfect answer. There is no yes or no. It really just depends on which of the things on the left you're trying to do and what your goals are. Okay, I mean, this definitely shows the trend and um, right. at, as, as uh, take home messages. Um, I have a very last one uh, now, uh, bearing in mind that uh, we are already uh, together for more than one and a half hours and that we have a little tea break uh, um, in front of us. Um, but I think that's an important one. And um, there is uh, generally, um, sympathy, of course, with uh, the open access policies, but there's a concern with the privatization of public goods, and that has also been mentioned in one of the um, lectures today. So um, if it comes to privatization of uh, pu public goods, then, of course, questions of intellectual property immediately play a role. And um, here, the question is, uh, how can one then address the IP problem, which is a broad problem, I believe here, around, uh, around DSI. Any uh, quick thoughts on, on that? Or maybe just to uh, allude, and that would probably be to, to Margot, what are the current instruments and the, um, uh, the current IP framing around DSI? So yeah, that's a challenging one. I mean, many, many, it, it varies somewhat from country to country, but many DSI-based inventions are protected and protectable by patents um, or trade secrets. Um, so um, IP protection is available. And the fact that you are able to patent in some countries a sequence doesn't stop you from putting it in a publicly accessible database. And it doesn't mean that you lose your IP rights once it's in the database, which is something that um, is a challenge when we talk about genetic resource rights versus patent rights. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what, what exactly you're looking for in relation to the protection to the, in relation to the question, but yes, I mean, patent protection is, is very much available. We have some limitations in the US, but many countries don't have those same. Limitations. Okay, I think this deserves another webinar only on the relationship between IP and DSI for sure, and I'm quite sure that we'll get there over over the over the course of uh, uh, the next months and the run up to to COP. Um, Amber, just a short note. Guy noted it in his like second to last slide. Any sequence data that is associated with a patent is submitted by requirement to the INSCC. 
and there in the database, there's a tag with three letters. It says P-A-T in capital letters, and that's the PAT tag, which means it was a, this uploaded or submitted to the INSDC as part of a patent application. All right, thanks. Thanks a lot. We are running now already four minutes over time. And um, from my end, thanks a lot, but I'll hand over back to uh, Olivier. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I think I just wanted to use this opportunity to thank all the panelists for their time and very, very fruitful and useful contributions. You raised a number of issues that actually require some follow-up. Um, Margot, the last issue on uh, uh, IP and uh, DSI is a world in its own, I think. Um, of course, Val, uh, uh, it would have been great also to hear a little bit more about uh, the questions, uh, the more technical issues. And I think this, this shows that there is uh, quite a lot of discussions to be had. And of course, Guy and Amber, where you've raised a lot of interesting questions. And, and I think it shows the appetite for the issues. And uh, I think this is just the beginning. Uh, I hope it's just the beginning. So a word to the organizers also to, to think through these complex issues and think where, you know, sort of where the next steps will be with regards to clarifying some of the questions. And um, so I wanna thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for your very useful presentations. And, uh, and now, um, yeah, thank you. And we have a break now, I think. I hope you had a nice break. I'm Eva and it is my pleasure to moderate the second session of our webinar today. The purpose of the session is to provide you with an overview of how DSI is being dealt with in international fora. We will start the session with a presentation by Dr. Hartmut Meyer, who will inform us about approaches and negotiations regarding DSI in selected UN fora. Hartmut Meyer is the team leader of the ABS initiative, and he has been following the topic of access and benefit sharing since the conference of the parties um, for in 1998. He has participated in the Nagoya Protocol negotiations as an NGO observer and has an impressive number of publications on the topic. Since 2013, he has been employed at the ABS initiative where he has been dealing extensively with the topic of DSI from 2016 onwards, for example, as a co-author of the ABS initiative's DSI primer. We are also very privileged to have here with us today, Dr. Vasi Morti from the World Health Organization and Mr. Daniele Manzella from the Secretariat of the International Treaty at the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, who will provide their expert opinion on the topic following Hartmut's presentation. Um, to give you a brief overview, Dr. Murti works at the Science to Policy Interface at the WHO based in the newly created science division, and he is co-lead for the WHO's R&D blueprint for action to prevent epidemics, which coined the term disease X in 2017, to highlight the need for the world to prepare for a pandemic from a future novel human pathogen. COVID-19 is the world's first disease X pandemic. As part of his role in the science division, Dr. Murthy coordinates liaison between the many pathogen-specific global initiatives in the WHO, including influenza, polio, measles, and many others. He's a physician, immunologist, and clinical researcher, and his work has focused on how best to support low- and middle-income countries in linking research with access to new technologies and medical products in their health systems. Daniel Manzella ser serves the Secretariat of the International Treaty at the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations as technical officer. He is a policy and legal specialist who has advised international organizations and assisted developing countries on various technical themes at the intersection of environment, agriculture, and trade. He has attended the meetings of the Ad Hoc Technical Expert Group on DSI and promotes continuous expert dialogue in order to generate a mutually reinforcing interface between science and policy. I would like to extend a warm welcome to all our three speakers and thanks for being here with us. Before um, we start with the presentation by Hartmut, I would like to remind you that you can submit questions in the Q&A function, which is available at the toolbar located at the bottom of your screen. And I also invite you to use the Q&A function to upvote or to like questions by clicking on the thumb, which you can also find in the Q&A box. So if there are any specific questions that you would like us to pick up in the Q&A session, feel free to like or upvote questions. 
and we will address questions that are coming in after the speaker's presentations. Um, without further ado, I would like to give the floor to our first speaker. Hartmut, please go ahead with your presentation. I'm hopefully very quickly we'll go through um, the various <clears throat> UN fora and negotiations which deal with DSI. So also to, to underline that DSI is not only a topic um, dealt with in the CBD, but it's actually, and I think this also will become clear from um, the presentations we heard before, it's actually a topic in all UN fora that deal um, with living organisms and how to use them for breeding, for medicinal purposes, etc. cetera. Um, therefore, <clears throat> I first um, like to go very briefly into what I call the biological or biology background of the different debates. That means uh, with which kind of organisms and products are these uh, for a dealing, which also will explain a little bit about their uh, direction of negotiation and talks. And um, so it's essentially an overview about the CBD, the two fora in FIO, the International Seed Treaty and the Commission on Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture. It is on the PIP framework of the WHO and of the UN negotiations on a regime for biological diversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction under UNCLOS. Well, um, we already heard about the examples of COVID. Um, what we need to see is that um, there is uh, already an agreement, a benefit sharing agreement, a multilateral agreement on uh, the pandemic influenza viruses um, of the WHO. It uh, covers influenza viruses with pandemic potential and the production of vaccines. And essentially viruses, as we also heard, are extremely simple yeah, organisms. Um, they largely consist of, of a set of uh, nuclear acids, RNA, DNA, and corresponding proteins. So, and um, that makes it very probable and it's very close to the nature of these organisms that the DSI, the matter of information, is very closely linked to the use of these organisms and to the um, discussions in this PIP framework. The next uh, treaty is the FIO International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture. It covers plants, as it says, when used for food and agriculture and um, a certain set of the plants which are in that annex of the treaty. And I think um, when we look into the topics which are um, important in the context of DSI discussion at that, um, for, uh, it is, of course, mainly focusing on plant selection and breeding, identifying genes, understanding patterns of heredity, etc. cetera. Um, so the, um, the deliberations in this treaty will, of course, uh, include um, the um, identification and sequencing of DNA and proteins, and it will um, deal with the use of um, a certain amount of biochemicals in these plants for different uh, food and agricultural purposes. And also, of course, for example, in the um, use of these nut katung, um, DSI can be used to produce these kind of chemicals in, in um, genetically modified organisms. So that's a certain range of possibilities where um, DSI plays into the, um, yeah, the deliberations under this treaty. Where are we? Um, the next um, important UN fora is the FAO Commission on Genetic Resources and Food and Agriculture. That um, covers uh, animals, fungi and bacteria and certain plants when used for food and agriculture. Um, there we have, um, let's say, a, a wider context in which DSI is discussed. It is essentially the same biological principles, but now uh, covering, let's say, animal breeding or the use of 
fungi in food preparations or in fermentations, etc. And I just just outlined some examples. For example, the extraction of riboflavin or the use of riboflavin from many organisms. Also, that product can now be synthesized, and also DSI can of course be used in this um, process of synthesizing. So also there, um, there's a lot of um, application of DSI which would um, yeah would fall under the under the scope of um, this commission and then we go to the CBD <clears throat> and here I think the the main the main difference uh, to the um, FRO framework of course and also the two FIO uh, WHO framework and the two FAO um, um, groups is that the CBD covers all kinds of organisms and viruses for any use. So we we cover activities which come from taxonomy, ecology, physiology, go to to industrial bio biotechnology, to mes medicinal applications, etc. So the the range of organisms and the range of actors which um, are acting in the CBD is extremely broad. And, and also that came up in some of the questions, the CBD also covers associated traditional knowledge of indigenous peoples and local communities that certainly will also play into the DSI issues. So from that perspective, the discussions in the CBD are I would call them the most complex discussions and also um, we can also see that the discussions in the CBD are um, sort of at the beginning and some of the other in, um, further are more or less waiting on what the CBD is going to discuss. Also below some just some um, examples where biochemicals from organisms are now used in industrial processes and where also DSI could play a role in producing them. The last um, issue is uh, the last for is the um, uh, UNCLOS um, negotiations on areas beyond national jurisdiction where essentially the coverage of organisms is the same than the CBD, but it's just another, um, another area, especially the high C in that regard. To give you a brief overview, what happened in this UN photo is that as, yeah, as it was already underlined, the DSI issue was put on the table in the CBD COP in 2016. Um, CBD decided to analyze the implication of DSI on all three objectives that also <clears throat> was mentioned in some of the previous uh, presentations. Um, we have seen a lot of submissions on DSI to uh, the CBD secretariat and without knowing it exactly, I think this was certainly a topic which received the most submissions since years, which were sent to the CBD secretariat. Um, the whole discussion started with a study um, and um, the first meeting of the technical expert group on fact-finding and scoping issues. Also there, we had a lot of um, responses. The next step was a further discussion at COP14, which decided to establish a science and policy-based process um, to elaborate recommendations how the COP15 should address DSI in the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. And as, as we know, this, this webinar and many other um, activities are part of the science and policy-based process. Again, we have, um, in the end, we came out with four more studies, which also are referred to in, in the question and answers. And there was a second uh, technical expert group on operational terms, and that will be um, dealt with in the next webinar. What is going to happen in the international treaty? Um, in the treaty, um, the 
DSI issue is discussed in the context of revising the standard material transfer agreement. Uh, it was proposed to have a new definition what genetic parts and the components are. Um, that proposal was not accepted, and um, but it was decided similar to the CBD to consider the implications of DSI on the objectives. Um, also the International Treaty commissioned a scoping study, um, which is of course available, and it continued in its um, working groups eight and nine on the multilateral system to discuss DSI. Um, so this I is mentioned in this draft uh, text, but also there is no agreement um, how to deal with DSI or what DSI actually means. Um, in 2019, the governing body of the treaty then decided to continue the collaboration with the CBD um, on a mutual supportive process. So you can see that also there the discussion is sort of um, yeah, in a standstill, and um, it is a lot of um, um, reference to the CBD discussion. The Commission on Genetic Resources um, is not actually um, dealing with an international treaty or something, but with a um, yeah, with how to um, govern other genetic resources and. The regular session in 2017 of the Commission established a work stream, as it is called, on DSI in genetic resources for food and agriculture. Um, also there, we, we have a fact-finding study focusing on various issues, um, submission by parties. And also there in 2019, it was agreed that the discussion and gathering views on DSI should continue. The, there are a lot of intergovernmental technical working groups in this commission on the various organisms and topics. They also should continue to discuss DSI. So, so there, it's an ongoing discussion. Um, the PIP framework and I, my analysis is that this um, is due to the, yeah, biological basis of the viruses. The PIP framework itself um, is, let's say, much more advanced. Uh, the framework itself um, asks um, for discussion and clarification what DSI means, and it's called, here it is called the genetic sequence data, GSD. Um, so it's already the discussion on GSD, respective DSI, is based on the wording of this um, agreement. And in 2015, um, it was discussed um, whether the data should be made available in data banks that have um, access agreements posing certain conditions on the users, or whether the data should be rather made public in data banks that have no access agreements, which doesn't say that there are benefit sharing um, options in these conditions, but it um, it uh, was the discussion whether there should be any conditions on data or not, if you access them in data banks. Um, that also was not, as far as I know, really resolved. Um, in 2016, there was uh, the attempt to, um, to really amend the definition um, of the material to define what genetic sequence data should mean in the context of this definition. Um, that recommendation was not followed also um, with view on the process in the CBD. So I, I think that also the WHO um, decided not to take um, any, um, any um, yeah, recommendations or any decisions before the CBD um, was really discussing the issues and then came to some sort of conclusions. What happens in the UNCLOS, that's the last, um, yeah, again, a negotiation which takes part. Um, just maybe you are not really familiar with this one. It was decided in 2015 to develop a legally binding instrument on 
um, marine biological diversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction. Um, that was a big step forward after many years of preparation. And meanwhile, there were some meetings of intergovernmental conferences discussing the text of this future instrument. And also that text mentions the DSI and the use of terms, etc., but also has not yet worked on any kind of really text for the definition or, or on what actually DSI should mean in this context. Well, um, also the, um, the draft text for the next um, session of this conference, which anyway is postponed, um, shows that there are many divergent or uh, opposing views of party, parties vis-a-vis -vis DSI. And also that process, I guess, um, will more or less wait on what the CBD is going to discuss and maybe to decide. So that this tells us that uh, apart from the complexity in the technical issues in biology and in data bank um, issues, there is also a highly interlinked international discussion how to deal with DSI. And at the moment, it seems that um, the, yeah, the different fora are not really willing to take a step ahead. And we also have to see that, of course, um, although we deal with different UN fora, in the end, um, there's all the same governments sitting there with different ministries. And so the more DSI becomes a very um, yeah, a general topic in all the fora that deal with um, biological issues with organisms, the more also governments um, are going to coordinate internally on the issue. And I think that um, it is very crucial when you look at the DSI discussion from a policy point of view that there need to be um, yeah, coordinated approaches to this within the government and between the governments. Right? So this is my overview about the fora, and I think we can have a um, good and interesting discussion on the implications of this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hartmut, for mm -hmm. this very interesting presentation, which uh, provides us a comprehensive overview of the discussions and approaches regarding DSI in international fora. Thank you very much for that. Um, I would now like to invite Vasi Morti to share his ideas with us from his perspective as a WHO expert. Mm -hmm. um, Vasi, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Eva. I, I'm not going to show any slides. Um, I'm going to talk through some critical um, perspectives from the World Health Organization. Thank you so much for inviting us. I, I listened with a lot of interest to Hartman's very good presentation, also some of the others. Um, I, there are two parts to what I'm going to say. First is, is general, and then second, just to give a quick update from the PIP framework perspective. So first of all, just to say, I think what is already clear, hopefully to everyone, that we, we tend to, I'm not going to use the acronym DSI, we normally refer to genetic sequence data sharing, but pathogen genetic sequence data sharing is really of fundamental importance for science, for medicine, for research, for public health, and that, that importance is only increasing. And so it's only natural that WHO engages with many initiatives um, and networks in this area across a number of viral and bacterial diseases. Um, a big focus on emerging infectious diseases, but also big global networks in um, certain vaccine preventable diseases, such as polio, where we have a, a huge global network of 145 laboratories that are, are collaborating centers for the World Health Organization. Measles, um, HIV, TB, malaria, each one of these is, is just a vast um, network in its own right. And it's important to be clear that there's no one size fits all set of applications or solutions. The applications um, really differ depending on, on the area that you're in. If the um, viewers are interested in a WHO report that lays out um, the use cases in emerging infectious diseases, there's a 2017 report on our website, an R&D blueprint um, consultation on emerging infectious disease um, pathogen genetic sequencing applications that lays out the use cases from initial confirmation of the cause of outbreaks to 
um, early on absolutely critical development and validation of the diagnostic testing to supporting surveillance to monitoring for emergence of important mutations which might be relevant to treatment and vaccines and developing therapeutics and vaccines. And around the same time, we coined this term disease X because we were particularly concerned about the fact that all of the experts in the animal human interface area were predicting that there were going to be more and more uh, new human pathogens that emerge as spillover events. And the role of rapid access to quality control genetic sequences here, we knew would be really very critical as without access to those sequences, the very first diagnostics for a new human pathogen couldn't be developed and control measures couldn't be um, effectively implemented. And I know some of the other speakers have already talked about the situation in uh, early this year with SARS-CoV-2, but I just want to briefly go through that from our perspective, because I think this is a very, very critical uh, use case for the role of um, GSD in, in human health. So here, I think what's very important is that one can only apply the sequence data if it is shared rapidly. And we shouldn't assume in this area that it is always shared rapidly. And we've seen really rather patchy um, timeliness of, of sharing of genetic sequence data in certain outbreak conditions. Some, sometimes can be politically sensitive. In this case, um, this model known as the GISAID model, which um, many, many, many countries that have a lot of comfort with from influenza experience became really critical. And the Chinese government in the, the second week of January made publicly available through GISAID initially a number of quality controlled SARS-CoV-2 sequences. And actually the same day that the first set were made available um, publicly to anybody who wished to have access for free, um, we were able to organize a, a teleconference of, the, of our collaborating centers to um, look at how we can very, very rapidly develop the initial diagnostic tests for SARS-CoV-2. This was January the 12th, and that went very quickly as a result. So the, the work that then um, spread around the world within you know, hours um, really did critically depend on the ability for these sequences to, make, to be made publicly available. So we see that as, as a success story. As of now, over 110 countries have Share, and scientists from these countries have shared over 200,000 SARS-CoV-2 sequences um, through the different models that we have. So there's GISAID and then there's the, the there was a presentation um, describing the INSDC approach. Um, so you know, these are all important, but we do see the rapid large scale and highly geographically dispersed nature of, of SARS-CoV-2 genetic sequence sharing as, as a success story. And we think it's very important to look at the lessons learned and think about the counterfactual. If that hadn't have happened, the really awful um, negative impacts that that would have had on our ability to respond to this pandemic cannot be overestimated. So we have to uh, look at how this worked and make sure it's going to work in the future. So we do advocate for the early public sharing of pathogen genome sequence data during outbreaks, whilst having options available that give the submitters comfort and, and really accelerates timeliness of sharing in, in all circumstances related to outbreaks. And some of, the, some of these factors that are, are important are, are, I would say, non-monetary benefits are really very, can be quite important here, including um, the comfort with the platform and issues around uh, credit from publications and um, to what extent models support scientific collaboration. Another point is that we, as everybody, uh, I think listening would probably be aware, we're in the middle of, of a, um, an, a time of, of extraordinarily rapid progress with sequencing capacity around the world. And in a very short number of years, this has changed dramatically. So that there's, there's pathogen genetic sequencing capacity in, in essentially every country now, um, rapidly increasing. I think what's a little behind is the, the capacity to analyze that sequence data is, is less well geographically distributed. And there's, there's a big need to support um, analysis capacity strengthening globally. Another issue that we have seen previously in WHO is that there have been cases where important sequences have not been made publicly available, apparently in relation to um, 
embargoes for scientific manuscripts. Going back to 2014, this seemed to happen. And we were clear that this was not in the interests of public health. We reached out at that time to the International Council of Medical Journal Editors, and we asked them to make it very explicit in their guidelines that pre, um, pre-publication, pre-manuscript publication sharing of genetic sequence data should not only be permissible, but should be the norm. And I think that has changed a lot and that, that is generally becoming the norm now, but not always. We anticipate that um, capacity and applications will continue to expand um, with discussions now quite advanced in some settings about embedding whole genome sequencing into diagnostics networks and into national surveillance systems. And that was a change with SARS-CoV-2 where the, where the sequencing itself became quite an important part of the, of the very initial diagnostics. So that, that area is moving really very quickly. I think potentially in, in longer time frames, I, I don't know how long, um, whole genome sequencing is likely to, to really penetrate into service delivery at different levels of the health system. Um, and as gene editing techniques advance, sequencing is likely to become really a, a core aspect of almost all aspects of, of medicine with applications in, in pathogen vector and, and human biology. So you can see we're engaging very strongly in this because it's, it's of increasing importance in public health and diagnosis and clinical practice and product development. And so uh, going back to um, a point that Hartman made, I think one really important um, conclusion from this would be that it's, it's very important that there are uh, multi-sectoral, ideally whole of government approaches that are applied in deciding on implementation of legislation that might be originating outside of the health sector. I'm speaking from the perspective of the health sector so that health aspects can be taken adequately into account. And finally, just in, in one minute, I just wanted to give a, an update that uh, I was provided from my colleagues in the, within the PIP secretariat. So a little more on what Hartman said about GSD and, and the PIP framework. So this is the pandemic influenza preparedness framework. GS, genetic sequence data derived from influenza viruses with human pandemic potential are included under the PIP framework, but importantly, not in the definition of PIP biological materials, which includes physical um, samples and also includes materials such as candidate vaccine viruses. Under the PIP framework, our very large network of, of WHO collaborating centers for influenza are expected to upload genetic sequence data um, related to influenza viruses of pandemic potential to a publicly accessible database in a timely manner. The PIP advisory group has been requested to look into um, the optimal characteristics and best practices of a GSD sharing system that best meets the objective of the framework. And they have come up with four principles um, which were available from some of the written outputs of this work. And that those four principles are that there should be rapid sharing of high quality genetic data for timely risk assessment and response. There should be sustainable public access to genetic sequence data related to influenza viruses of pandemic potential. There should be fair and equitable sharing of benefits arising from the sharing of GSD. And there should be acknowledgement of data providers and active collaboration between data providers and users. So I'll, I will stop there. Um, yes. There's, Thank you. there's a lot more that I could say. I'll stop there. Thanks. Yes, I can imagine. Thank you very much, Vasi. Unfortunately, we're running out of time. Um, but that was a great input and you've raised very important points. And I thank you for sharing your insight and your expertise with us. Um, I'm sure there are questions that we can address in our question and answer session, which will follow shortly. But now I would like to hand over to Daniele Manzella, who will provide us with his expert view as a technical officer at the Secretariat of the International Treaty at the FAO. And um, yes, please, Daniele, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Eva, and let me convey that the Treaty Secretariat that I represent today is engaged in closely following discussions on digital sequence information or genetic sequence data at the CPD. Um, as you all know, our collaboration with the, CP, with the CPD Secretariat and with uh, um, APS actors continues in order to pursue coherence and mutual supportiveness, uh, promote 
uh, dialogue and reciprocal learning among the constituencies. So thanks uh, to the organizers for this opportunity. I would like to start with a rapid overview of the current state of affairs within the treaty, uh, the production and use of the SI in relation to plant genetic resources for food and agriculture have become fundamental to both modern conservation strategies and, uh, and to molecular breeding. Uh, the treaty is faced with this uh, evolution, which is undeniable, uh, regardless of the specific options for uh, legal reform. The main thread of the discussion within the treaty, as Helmut has already uh, explained, uh, has been on how to balance open access principles with principles of equity and benefit sharing, taking into account uh, advances in science and technology. Uh, so far, the DSI discussions uh, have largely been merged into those on the announcement of the multilateral system of access and benefit sharing and structured around the two uh, SMTA options, namely single access and subscription system. The SI have also been discussed in relation to the uh, coverage of the multilateral system and divergent views remain as to how and to what extent to reflect issues related to uh, the SI. So given such state of affairs with the international treaty in my remarks, I would like to embrace for a moment an institutional perspective and touch upon the dynamics of change in ABS international instruments that the DSI stress factor may be inducing. Now there are multiple possible patterns of change of environmental and resource uh, uh, re re regime. Briefly, literature identifies five. Progressive development, punctual equilibrium, arrested development, diversion and collapse. Uh, which pattern do instruments follow? Uh, well, all the instruments, all the ABS instruments have established governance structure and it is, it, it is ultimately the collective responsibility of the various treaty convention bodies within the respective mandates, of course, to direct and improve the quality of change. In this respect, uh, the, the work on the announcement of the multilateral system, although not successful so far, has certainly been a first attempt in this direction. It is definitely an example of a path dependent process because past uh, ag agreements in the case of the treaty, the SMTA, still constitute the framework for responding to the changes. But I would like to note uh, that the acquisition of learning skills is an important factor, both at the individual and at the collective levels. And despite the current halt of formal negotiations within the treaty, reflexive mechanisms that gather and assess existing knowledge and as such pave the way for new decisions, continue to operate. And this is certainly a positive element. Now, um, let, me look for, um, let me look for one second at Helmut's comp comprehensive of overview. And I would like to also briefly touch upon the pl pluralistic institutional environment that Helmut has uh, illustrated, meaning the relations among the different instruments and not only instruments, but institutions as well that constitute what I would define as a fragmented architecture. Now, the question of how such agreements and institutions collectively evolve over time and reduce or augment fragmentation deserves uh, examination. And I believe that the ongoing consideration of the SI will provide definitely new material for policy analysis. The level of institutional integration and the actor configuration are factors of such evolution. Uh, we are probably still in a phase of experimentation and selection of fora. And as, and, uh, as a consequence, norm conflicts have not clearly emerged so far, but I think they are another key determinant to keep inside. Uh, once again, um, uh, li literature helps. Uh, precisely Richard Zagan in 2014, and I would like to give proper credit to the analysis that I'm about to, um, again, to uh, briefly illustrate. Um, Richard Zagan summarizes three levels of fragmentation of governance architectures. 
And the good news, I think, for all of us are that not all of the three are necessarily negative. Certainly, uh, conflictive fragmentation may occur in a situation where different core institutions are not connected at all. We have conflicting principles and different actors support different institutions. Cooperative fragmentation may lead to a partial integration through interinstitutional cooperation and uh, pr pr procedures, but would still, um, in a way, um, was still uh, char characterized or be characterized by an, by an uncertain relationship between norms and some actors as a consequence would not be fully in integrated. Uh, synergistic fragmentation is also possible. And synergistic fragmentation would occur with a with an very high degree of uh, uh, inter, inter, inter integration. Just to give one example, one core institution that leads on a certain issue uh, would also closely cooperate with other relevant institutions. They would be the gradual harmonization of norms and the inclusion of all relevant actors. Now, in this brief remarks, it's certainly not for me to assess at what level of fragmentation we are at present as, uh, as an ABS community. Uh, but my hope is that these categories, again, conflictive, cooperative, and synergistic fragmentation are not just descriptive or explanatory of status quo, but would also provide useful parameters to guide stakeholders' decisions in the respective processes in order to address critical factors and correct weaknesses. Now, in closing uh, these brief re remarks and by way of summary, I would like to underscore these two points. Number one, the complexity of the DSI problem uh, issue motivates progress in the institutional design and the organizational processes within the conventions themselves in order to generate a more positive feedback loop between actors, resources, and institutions, and ultimately the decision-making nodes. Uh, second point, uh, the SI institutional, institutional dynamics may lead us to reconsidering the old paradigm of separation versus formal coordination or even unification of instruments. Fragmentation does not mean chaos and the progressive integration of adaptive systems may indeed be a desirable scenario. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniele, for your excellent input. Um, I trust that our participants have found this very interesting and very useful. And uh, I thank you for being here with us. Um, being mindful of our time here, I would now go straight into the question and answer session. I'm sure that Suel has received many questions by now and we will get through as many questions as time allows. But just to let you know that all questions, including those that have not been discussed, will serve as a basis for the compilation of frequently asked questions on DSI that Andreas mentioned before. And um, yes, I kindly ask Suhel to present us with the questions. Um, Suhel, if you're ready, please go ahead. Well, how can one ready with all these questions? Um, um, we we do have still emerging questions for the last panel um, that we cannot address here, but I mean uh, that will all feed into um, this consideration of uh, frequently art, uh, asked asked questions. Um, uh, what would be of interest now for this uh, uh, more forum oriented uh, panel. So I think there was one um, one question, but we don't have anyone to answer that. But I, I think for the sake of completeness, it's quite important. But there was also a question with respect to the world uh, to the work of WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization, and the Intergovernmental Committee, uh, which is working on um, issues of intellectual property rights and genetic resources uh, and, and uh, traditional knowledge, of course. Uh, um, there, I, I can say from experience, it is an emerging issue and um, that it has not officially been um, uh, uh, brought in into the fora. Of course, there are quite some, some frictions now, uh, how to uh, link that with uh, these discussions on mandatory disclosure of uh, uh, the origin of genetic resources and, and DSI. Um, so we may um, look into um, the, the work of WIPO in a, 
in a future webinar in, in, in that regard. Um, a question that, that has been raised and um, is uh, uh, the correlation and, and the linkage uh, of, of DSI with respect to, to farmers' rights. And uh, I would um, maybe, um, I think Daniele might be the, the one to, to um, respond to that, to what extent um, at the level of the treaty, but of the FAO um, it, itself, of course, much more, um, there are discussions on that linkage. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Well, well the, um, there is an established process within the international treaty through an ad hoc expert group, which is looking at, uh, at uh, compiling experiences on the implementation of farmers' rights at the national, at the national level and also developing um, um, options that, again, countries and other stakeholders uh, may uh, re re recur to in order to implement farmers' rights according to the provisions of Article 9 of the International Treaty is a very um, uh, sort of, it's a very populated process with many uh, st st stakeholders expressing views and also sharing the experiences in the various, uh, uh, in the various uh, sub 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 submissions and in the, in the in the actual compilation of options. I think that so far the issue of DSI, at least with, again, with, its, with, this, with a specific focus on genetic sequence data is not being prominent, but uh, one could expect that at some point it could also, it could also become so given, given the relevance of digital sequence inf information for the three objectives on the international treaty as a whole, which of course also mm -hmm. means the objectives of the of the CBD, farmers' rights is a, a specificity of the inter international in, international treaty, but uh, I would expect that uh, again the DSI issues, at least in, in these general terms, would actually also uh, appear in the context of uh, of the ongoing work on farmers' rights. Again, it's uh, on, the work is still ongoing. It's a very dynamic process. And I think there are, and there will be ample opportunities for all the various uh, stakeholders uh, to express their views and also hopefully to share their practical um, experience with uh, uh, impl implementation. Yeah, thanks. Um, and maybe taking some of that, of, of the discussions from, uh, and, and Q and A's from um, the last session, which were a lot on um, the definition of, uh, of the subject matter, uh, where of course we know that at the level of the C, uh, CBD there is, um, um, there is un an unsatisfaction of course with uh, uh, how it is uh, uh, defined for the time being. Uh, maybe to, to, the, to both of you, uh, so uh, in um, defining what, uh, what we're talking about, I mean, is it then uh, gene sequence data or uh, um, uh, at, at the level then of, of, of the treaty, um, how can one get to, let's say, a, a narrow definition and, and, and common ground from experience from the both fora? I think this would be something quite important to learn uh, for colleagues in the CBD. Who wants to give it uh, a start first? <laughs> Maybe uh, Dr. Morthy, at the level of the, from, from the WHO perspective? There's not too, I'm probably not the right person to go into the details of the definitions of, of GSD within the PIP framework. Um, but all I can, so definitions, are, it's a very complicated area. Um, scientifically, what is clear is that one requires access to at least some minimal amount of metadata in addition to the actual sequence itself. So if you have the genetic sequence um, that gives you the DNA residues, there's nothing much you can do with that. So we have for sharing and for collaboration all have some way of linking the sequence data to 
varying tiers of, of levels of metadata. I mean, you start off with a minimum in the date of accession um, and the location and the institution providing it. But you, the more there is, clearly, the more scientifically one can, can do and potentially the more from the public health perspective. But, but then also the more complex some of the ethical and, and potentially legal implications are, the more metadata there is linked. So these are some of the considerations. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Daniela. Was it or is it easier at the level of, uh, of the treaty? Well, uh, certainly not easy for any of the ABS instruments. But on the other hand, so far it has been extremely easy for us simply because the, because the governing body of the international treaty has basically deferred or sort of has, a, has adopted what Helmut uh, uh, called the wait and see ap approach vis-a-vis -vis the CPD process. So I think obviously uh, our constituency looks with, uh, with a lot of attention at the work of the uh, ACTEG. I was actually part of the ACTEG and it, I've contributed also to both the discussions over scope and over possible terminology. Whether in the future the governing body of the International Treaty will want to have its own take on, mm. the, on this particular issue, honestly, remains to be seen. And, uh, uh, I think it would be probably premature to pre 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 predict that, but certainly and along the lines that I've indicated in my, in my previous uh, rem remarks, there's certainly a need to closely coordinate and to ensure that there is, there is an harmonious adaptation of the, of the ABS system to the um, in a way to the new frontier that that that, that is being appraised in this context through the prism of uh, uh, DSI access and uh, access and use, and obviously this will have an impact on um, on terminology as well. Okay, Daniele, thanks a lot, uh, and also um, thanks, uh, Dr. Uh, Morthy. And uh, with that, also in the interest of time, I have to give back now to uh, to Eva and. Um, Yes, I, of course, it was a pleasure and see you soon. Thank you very much, Sohel. Uh, thank you to all our speakers. Um, this has been a very rich and fruitful discussion. And I would like to thank the participants for their questions. And of course, our speakers, once again, for their insightful contributions and also their time. Um, in the interest of time as well, I would now like to give the floor to Andreas. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Eva. And a big thank you from my side as well to all the panelists and contributors to the discussions. I think um, was a very useful uh, webinar from my perspective. And I learned a lot um, on, on the issues <clears throat> at stake. And I think some key messages from my perspective are that DSI is being handled so far it, largely in an open access manner and that this is very beneficial for scientific progress and um, that's also one of the reasons why we need a kind of international solution for the benefit sharing of, of, of uh, um, related to DSI. We learned also that DSI contributes and benefits conservation and sustainable use under two of the objectives of the convention. Of course, benefit sharing in the, com in the case of commercial utilization for commercial products is an open question, an open issue where, uh, where, some, where some solutions need to be elaborated, whether national, which may be difficult, or <clears throat> at international level, which, as it was uh, proposed or suggested in, in some of the contributions. Um, one of the challenges in that in regulating DSI obviously is that um, one sequence is not enough to, to, to come up with anything. Uh, you need a multitude of uh, different uh, sequences and, and with a multitude you get into a multitude of legal jurisdictions which makes it very difficult to, to regulate anything in it. <clears throat> ESI definitely uh, also a take off a take home message I, I got is will not replace genetic resources, but it will reduce the need of for, for the genetic resources. 
with reducing the need of genetic resources, of course, undermine somehow the objectives of the, of, of the Nagoya Protocol, of the access and benefit sharing objective. Um, <clears throat> And um, with DSI, there is of course a link to, digital, uh, to, to intellectual property right, but also uh, a link to yeah, health aspects, I think. That, that is actually also an aspect which we came across already um, with access to genetic resources as such, not only to DSI, that that is very often overlooked in, in the national regulatory frameworks um, that uh, for health-related research for for tropical diseases and so on, um, the uh, bilateral approach is creating a lot of transaction costs and delays, which uh, need to be overcome. <clears throat> and yeah, and of course the linkage of the discussions in the different fora and how can they learn from them or how do fora re relate back and are waiting now for what's happening under the CBD. I think it's also something which clearly highlights that under the CBD, we need to come up with uh, with quite clear guidance also for other fora uh, to, to how to deal and uh, how to deal with DSI. I think these are at least from my perspective, key messages which I took today. Uh, we, before handing over to for closing to Charlotte to the CB, of the CBD secretariat, um, two short hints. Uh, one uh, question in in uh, was very often uh, in the in, in the question and answer. Um, where the link to the video? And how uh, where can I get the video? Um, I <clears throat> the video is in, it's. It was a world premiere preview of of an almost finalized product. So there still there will be some case studies or case examples added to this video. So because I think quite you you notice that the end is quite abrupt and that there is not really a yeah a conclusion a way forward what uh, what needs to be addressed. So that is something which we still need to integrate and then to add to this video. And uh, these cases, of course, will relate to the three objectives of the convention. And as soon as this is completed, we will, of course, make this video publicly available on the ABS uh, Capacity Development Initiative website, through our YouTube channels, and also through the CBD websites, of course, uh, <clears throat> and uh, so that everyone can use the video uh, freely in its uh, in your capacity building awareness raising endeavors in your countries in your, with your constituencies. Um, and the second uh, remark from my side is that the I mentioned the first global DSI dialogue which the ABS initiative organized uh, last year in Pretoria. There will be a, a second global dialogue, uh, of course, this time in a virtual format um, how that exactly will be organized, uh, whether one session, several sessions spread over a certain uh, time. These are things which we are right now uh, currently discussing. And uh, that uh, will, the timing will depend also on the international uh, relevant, uh, relevant events like SBI and the open-ended working group and the timing of these, uh, these events. So there we are waiting also from signals from the, from the CPD secretariat. And as soon as we have a clear uh, roadmap for that, we will of course uh, make all this, all this information available to everyone. And uh, yes, as a last, very last um, uh, remark, uh, when you leave the meeting, there will uh, a page pop up with a short evaluation asking you for questions. Um, please, we would appreciate if you would have, take the one or two minutes to to fill in this question to give us feedback so that we can also learn how to improve our webinars and um, also for the future uh, to make them uh, more attractive and more informative and as possibly also more uh, for an exchange. <clears throat> with that, thank you from my side, and with that, back to the CBD Secretary, Charlotte, please. Thank you very much, Andreas. Uh, I really appreciate your closing remarks, and thank you to the whole team at the ABS uh, Capacity Building Initiative. I think this webinar has been um, 
really um, excellent, full of information, great speakers, and it's definitely a, a very good start to our webinar series. Um, so my name is Charlotte Germain Aubrey. I am an officer at the convention um, in the ABS unit, and I started recently, and my focus is on uh, digital sequence information itself. So I'm very interested to be here and very excited to present uh, the second webinar that will take place um, next week um, on the 9th and it will be from 9 a.m to uh, 11 a.m eastern time in the us and in north america and canada too uh, so it'll be a little later start for us um, in North America. Um, there, there is a link to register, you can't click here, but when you get the, the presentation sharing, you'll be able to click, but you can also find it on the CBD website. Um, the second webinar will be focused on the um, outcome of the ATEC um, work, uh, the Ad Hoc Technical Expert Group. Uh, we will start with three presentations on three of the um, peer-reviewed studies. So one on the concept, scope, and current use of DSI, the second on the combined study on uh, DSI and public and private uh, databases and traceability, uh, and the last one will be on domestic measures of DSI. So the um, uh, issue that we've uh, seen in this webinar on the definition of DSI will be addressed um, amongst others. The second part of the webinar will be um, by the co-chairs of the ATEC um, group, and they will present uh, the key outcomes of, um, of their work. So stay tuned and please um, come to the second webinar. The third webinar will be in the first quarter of 2021. The the exact date is still to be determined and uh, will be focused on policy options. So I think everybody's eagerly waiting for this um, discussion to, to happen. Um, so this, uh, this will be the last of the, the series of webinars. So from the CBD, we thank you very much and we hope to see you next week. Thank you.